from Psalm 71, 22, 23. I will praise you with the heart for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praise to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I whom you have redeemed.
it in two years. From Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Praise the Lord. down here so kind of wherever you're following up there about me <laughs> here we go Brenda lead us oh. Lord, we thank you for this glorious, beautiful morning that you have given to us, your creation, Lord. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given to us. 
thank you for the many blessings you've given to this church and this family. We ask, Lord, that your spirit be with us this morning as we give you praises and the glory of all that there is. We ask you uh, just enlighten us, that you would uh, give us a peace and give us your words of wisdom and truth. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, kids, come on down. I think we've got a children's moment, children's story here for you. We talked about how summer is coming, not this summer, but summertime is coming, and I'm all excited about things we get to do in the summertime. Do you remember what we talked about last week? What did we talk about last week? I had my beach towel and my floaty and my goggles. Going to the lake? What did we talk about? Who doesn't need any of those things? Jesus, Jesus because why? Because he can walk on He walked on the water. Well, last week, <laughs> last week we talked about that, and there's something that happened right before he walked on water. In the book of Matthew, it talks about he did something. Do you remember? I kind of talked about it just a tiny bit. Do you remember? No? Yeah. Well, do you notice my picnic basket? Oh, that's okay. I have a picnic basket. Who likes to go on picnics? You like to go on picnics? What do you normally take on your picnic with you? Bread. 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 What else? Jelly. And jelly. Do you make peanut, peanut butter, butter sandwiches? Sandwich. Yeah. What do you make when you take a... I usually make a sandwich with berries, mustard, and peanut butter. Oh, sandwiches. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and ham sandwiches. And somebody said fried chicken. <laughs> do you want to see what I have in my basket? Yeah. Okay. First of all, let's put this down here so we can see. Can you put your feet back just a tiny bit? There we go. All right. So the first thing I have is bread. Oh, so somebody did say bread. bread. Oh, look. Bread. Is this how you bring your bread? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. No. No. Okay. Where did this you guys don't make your sandwiches like this? No. Do you bring this much bread? How much bread is there? Five loaves of bread. Well, let's see what else I have in here. You know this story? Yeah. And what about this? What do I have here? Fish. You said, ooh, you don't like fish? Well, the other day we went fishing and Dan caught some fish and so there's two fish, there's flavor from two fish in there. So I have five loaves of bread and two fish. Is that what you take on your picnic? Yeah. No. Oh. I need to bring stuff for the bread to make sandwiches. Oh. Well. Let me tell you a story that is in the Bible. This is something that really happened. It was a true story. This is in Matthew 14, 14 through 21. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So he had been out in a boat and he landed. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Just like that. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. 
and the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. So like about 12 of these full of leftovers, okay? The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides the women and children. So what do you guys think? Could we take these five loaves and those two fish and feed 5,000 people? No. The 5,000 men plus the women and children? No. Could we even feed you guys that are right here with this amount? No. 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 So yeah. how, did, how was Jesus able to do that? He performed a what? A miracle. A miracle. He performed another miracle. So we know that anything is possible with Jesus, isn't it? Because he can do those great things. All right. Can you fold your hands and bow your head? Let's pray. Dear Lord, I'm just so grateful for these kids who come back every week to learn more about you. I pray that as they go through children's uh, church today, they learn even more and that they learn to love you with all their heart. Now I just ask that you be with us through the rest of this service and help us to learn more about you and to spread it to other people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you go to Miss Carol, she's right there and she's got a little treat for you. Okay, five years to fifth grade, they can go down to Children's Church. They want to do head that direction, and nursery's open for birth to four years. And it's <clears throat> this time that we will... Uh, have our worship and giving. Again, the boxes are in the back. You're welcome to put it in now or later. Uh, and uh, I want to repeat that uh, we are giving a missionary uh, love offering this morning as well, so you can designate that also. So pray with me. Lord, we thank you again for your, your loving kindness to, to this church, to each one here. Lord, we ask that uh, what we give today to uh, comes from a generous heart, and uh, it will be used as, uh, by the church as good stewards. And Lord, we uh, just pray that it will be multiplied to bring uh, people to your kingdom, to love you, and to be redeemed by you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Samuel chapter uh, 12, Samuel the prophet says, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. And this is one of the reasons why uh, we 
pray here at Alme Bible Church, and uh, the Lord wants us to pray and uh, pray for one another, and I pray for you. And uh, usually we have a little stack of prayer requests, and I didn't see any today, so if I missed them and there's elsewhere, we will get them this, and they'll be prayed for this week. Um, and normally you have that opportunity to share those, but so I'll, I'll just be praying for things that I've been praying for this week and things that have been on my heart, and I'll continue to pray for us as a church, and I invite you to join me in your hearts as, you, as I pray and to pray along with me in your hearts, and then we'll conclude praying the Lord's Prayer together. Michelle, do you have a, yeah? I, yeah, I have that on my list, and uh, Dennis reminded me of that as well when he saw there's no prayer request. Oh, pray for Israel. And it's on the list, so I'm sure uh, we'll be praying. I'm sure many people have been praying for that, and just the turmoil throughout the world. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world, and this is not taking God by surprise. And uh, as, as it gets closer to the end, things will keep getting worse. Uh, they're not going to get better, and Jesus described it as, as um, a, a woman in labor. The pain gets worse and worse, and then uh, the delivery is the worse, and then there's the joy of having new life. And so we do have hope as we see the world getting worse and worse. We know Christ will come and bring new life, and it will be glorious. So let's go ahead and uh, bow our heads before the Lord, and let's pray to him. Father in heaven, we lift you up with our voices because you are in the highest heavens and there is nobody worthy of anyone's worship but you alone. And so we do worship you with our singing. We worship you with our lives, with our time and our money. Lord, we worship you in prayer. We worship you uh, in our conversation and from reading your word. <laughs> Lord, I pray that we would be able to grasp uh, what is the, the height and the depth and the length and the width and the breadth of your love for us, that we might be compelled more and more to worship you and love you and respond to you. I pray that we would not doubt how great your love is for us. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful servants of your Son, that we would be walking in his footsteps, carrying our cross and following him to the natural place that a cross leads to, uh, dying to this life and living for you. Father, I pray for all me Bible Church. Lord, I pray that we will be a people whose hearts are after you. I pray that you would give us undivided hearts. Lord, I pray that we would, uh, you, you would unite our hearts to fear you, that you would fill our hearts with love for you and loyalty to you, and that we would not feel the draw of the world. I pray that you would keep us safe from uh, sinfulness, I pray that you would deliver us from evil, that we would not be tempted to deny you or love something more than you. Uh, Lord, we, you, though you are the highest in heaven, we know that you are close to us, and your Son has come down to live among us in this broken and fallen world, and we pray for this world, Lord. We pray that uh, your goodness will go out into the world. Uh, that we, your people, and all listening uh, will go out into the world with your love and with your message. Lord, we pray for all the unrest in the world. We pray that you would bring peace. We know that that will only come with the arrival of your son. And we pray for that. And we look forward to your son's return. We know it will happen, surely. Lord, we don't pray... Uh, just for tr a, a truce between enemies, but genuine peace. And we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray for um, civilians and uh, 
non-combatants throughout that area, Lord, that they would be uh, kept safe and you would, you would bring them safety. And we pray the same for those in the Ukraine, Lord. We pray that all this turmoil would turn people's hearts to you. Uh, Father, we pray that Israel will receive her king, that they would recognize Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, as their true king, the son of God, the waited for Messiah. And not only Israel, but all nations, Lord. We pray that people will recognize you as the one true God. We pray for our nation. So many people, Lord, in power or those rising to power from all levels, Lord, so few proclaim Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world and offer other solutions and other fixes. Lord, I pray that we would not be distracted by these, as convincing as they may sound, but we would... Uh, we would do good, that we would promote the good, and wait and depend on you. Father, we also lift up people in our midst that are, that are struggling, Lord. We know that there are people that have problems that we don't know about. We pray that you, they would feel your closeness nearby. We pray for Miss Sue, that she would be uh, recovering from the, the cancer that she's been diagnosed with. Lord, we pray that the treatments would be completely successful. We thank you for her varied ministries and work for the kingdom that you are accomplishing through her. We pray that those would be fruitful and bring more glory to you. Lord, we, we thank you for answering so many prayers that we have prayed. Thank you that my mom's uh, skin treatment was uh, effective, Lord. We pray that she would heal up from that. Thank you for answering our many prayers for Briston. And her, uh, her illness, Lord, we thank you for healing her. We pray that you'd continue to give her strength and uh, um, healing for the rest of her days, Lord. We pray for the children over in, in the children's service. We pray uh, for Megan and Riley as they share the word with them. We pray that you'd give them love and wisdom as they do that. We pray that you would uh, open the children's hearts to receive the message. And we pray that you would open our hearts to receive the, the news that you have for us today. We pray that you would stir our hearts with love and affection for you and for the lost world. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, in whose prayer we join together to pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we are no longer live. If you have been watching the service live, this is a recording. We have some friends with us at Only Bible Church, and they are sharing with us their gospel ministry in a country where it is best for their ministry not to be seen online or talked about online. So I'm going to be sharing with you a message from the book of Romans. And this is um, a great message that I have appreciated studying and preparing for, and I believe God will use it in your life as well. The title of this sermon is The Gospel for the Believer. On Easter Sunday, I preached what the gospel is, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he rose uh, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the grave. Uh, last Sunday, I preached about the sign of Jonah, in which Jesus used the prophet Jonah to teach that there is a judgment day coming. And um, the reason why the gospel is good news is because there's a judgment day, where everyone will be called accountable for their sin. The Bible teaches us that the wages or penalty for sin is death, and that is not talking about a temporary death, um, a death that you can experience here on earth, although that is terrible. What he's talking about is the eternal death, separation from God, eternal torment in the lake of fire. And that is the destiny of all those 
who do not accept the good news of Jesus. The good news of Jesus is good because it means even though I have sinned, my sins can be forgiven. They can be washed away, and I can go to that judgment day with confidence, knowing that Jesus will stand up for me and say, his sins have been taken care of. Jesus himself died on the cross for our sins. And this is good news to all who hear it, to all who will accept this good news. But this good news is not just something that gets us started on our journey with God. This good news is for all of us every day. And I want to teach this message from Romans 6 to explain how the Apostle Paul, even Jesus' apostle, he relied on this gospel daily. He did not rely on the gospel, and we should not rely on the gospel daily to keep us out of hell or to get us into heaven. That's been taken care of the first time we accepted it. And the moment we accepted it, Jesus gave us the gift of his Holy Spirit, sealing us. We will certainly be with Jesus for eternity in heaven. We will be safe from the punishment of sin. But I need to be relying on it daily, not to escape hell, but to live the life that God has for me, to live a life of godliness. I can't do it on my own. I have to continue to be relying on the gospel, thinking about it, and responding to it. And uh, you will see in this Bible passage, this is what Paul is talking about. Listen to how many times he says, we, we um, think this, we do this, we know this. So he's including himself, and then he gives an invitation to the um, listeners, to the Romans. He said, now you need to do this. Because this is what Paul does, and he's, he's inviting them to, to join him. So let me read God's word. This is the eternal word of God, and it is powerful, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it can penetrate into our hearts and souls. So listen to it, and uh, let's submit ourselves to God's word. From the epistle to the Romans, chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him for death for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Now, why, why did Paul start writing about this to the Romans? Uh, with the reception of the good news, the gospel, I have sin, I've got a terrible sin problem that dooms me, but the blood of Jesus washes those sins away. And he gives me the gift of righteousness. With this, this news uh, to be accepted by faith, this is the teaching that says God's grace saves you. You don't have to work hard to get saved. You don't have to accomplish all kinds of good works to get saved. God's grace saves you. You accept that by faith. Uh, faith alone. So some people may be thinking, oh, well, if that's the case, then my sin isn't a problem. I can just keep on sinning. I do like to sin. I'm going to keep sinning because God's grace saves me from that sin. And he answers that question. He says, or he asks the question, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So if my sin gets more, then there's going to be even more grace. So that's good, right? Well, he answers that by no means. How can we who die to sin 
still live in it. All right, so he's saying, he's teaching us, we died to sin. So why would you want to keep doing the sinfulness? You died to sin. How can you still live in it? All right, well, let's ask this question. How did we die to sin? Uh, in verse 3, he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? All right, so we died to sin through baptism. You've been baptized into Christ Jesus, so you've been baptized into his death, so you died to sin, is what his logic is here. Now, I'm convinced that this is not talking about water baptism. I have been baptized in water, and I baptize people in water. It's a godly ceremony. It's a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do. We're sinning if we're not baptizing people. But this is not the baptism that Jesus is talking to. And let me share with you a few Bible, Bible verses to explain to you why I don't think he's talking about baptism connects us to Jesus. Uh, besides me mentioning how it's through faith alone, grace alone through faith. This is how a person um, is born again, being, being put under water in the ceremony of baptism. That doesn't save you. Uh, so, But it sure sounds like in this verse that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. I think he's talking about a spiritual baptism. And let me share with you in Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. He's talking about circumcision. He says, In him also, in Jesus, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. All right? So circumcision is also a ceremony that can be done to people, just like baptism is a ceremony that can be done to people. This, cir this circumcision he's talking about, he said, this is done not with hands. Uh, this um, was the putting off of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It was a spiritual circumcision that they experienced by accepting the gospel. So I think this is the same thing he's talking about with baptism. It's not a physical baptism that we can do and should, but it's a spiritual baptism that the water baptism signifies. So continuing in Colossians chapter 2, he, he says, um, again, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So he in, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, he's saying both circumcision and baptism are both things done without human hands. It's, it's accomplished through faith in the power of God, faith in, in Jesus who was raised from the dead. Um, also, we can think of in John chapter 6, when Jesus is talking about eating his body, eating his flesh, and drinking his blood. That's not something we do literally. We, we have no flesh to eat. We have no blood to drink, the blood of Jesus. Uh, but we do a ceremony where we drink the fruit of the vine and we eat bread as a symbol of the spiritual act of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. We, we do baptism as a symbol of the spiritual act of being baptized into Jesus. And that, happen, that baptism happens through faith. It's what Jesus does. In John chapter 1, um, let me turn to John chapter 1, in verse 33, John the Baptist says, I myself did, uh, John the Baptist came baptizing with water. And he says, um, I myself did not know who Jesus was, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one that does the baptizing. We've been baptized into Jesus when he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. He baptizes us with the Holy Spirit when we believe this good news, this gospel message. So Paul, back in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, don't you know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus, his baptism by the Holy Spirit, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Why? Why did this... Why does this faith in Jesus connect us to Jesus' death? Be in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. So the good news, the gospel of Jesus, we accept it by faith, and that is uh, when Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and ensures that we will be with him for all of eternity. 
but we have died with him so that we we can live a new life. And this is the only way to get a new life. So my question to you is, do you struggle with sin? Do you recognize your need for a new life? I'm not talking about an altered life or an improved life, but a new life. Do you feel like you've accepted the good news of Jesus and you are a Christian, but you don't feel like you have a new life? This path, this Bible passage is for you. Stay with me and we'll see why this is the help that we need to understand this truth if you are feeling that way. So maybe you have accepted the gospel of Jesus, but you're not experiencing that new life that you thought you would. Maybe that's because you're treating the gospel like a door that you walk through. And you say, all right, I've accepted the gospel. Now I'm a Christian. Now I'm with Jesus. I'm waiting for the change to happen. But the gospel is not a door to walk through. It's a path to stay on. If you heard my sermon from Easter Sunday, you saw in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul said, this gospel, you stand in it. It's not something you pass through. It's something you stand in. It is the path that we continue on in the kingdom of God. And, and so um, this, this connection to the gospel, understanding it, and, and uh, growing in our understanding of it, is how we will find victory over sin in our lives. Um, if, if you think that the good news, the gospel, is just a door to get through, to get into the kingdom of heaven, and you don't need it any longer— um, and you can accomplish righteousness without it if you just say, oh, I'm just going to do what I know I need to do. I don't need to rely on the gospel for it. The reason why that doesn't make any sense is the gospel is the only thing that's powerful enough to save you, so it's the only thing powerful enough to grow you as well. Um, you've tried other things to, to get right with God, and none of them worked. Only the gospel worked. And so why would we try any other method to grow in our salvation? Uh, to have to have victory over sin and to be the godly people God wants us to be. Only the gospel can provide this for us. So this is why um, we were buried with Christ into his death so that we might be raised up to a new life. And then he continues in verse 5, we, If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So, Accepting the gospel unites us with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. All right, And we are expecting a physical, bodily resurrection uh, from the grave uh, someday, those of us who are in Jesus, who have been connected with him. But there is, there is a truth uh, connected to this idea of resurrection that affects us right now. This afternoon, as you go out and try to live your life for God, and this is where Paul is going with this idea. He continues in verse 6, where he says, we know that our old self was crucified uh, with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. All right, so being united with Christ in a new life means that we, we had an old life and an old self, but that old self died. Actually, that old self was crucified with Jesus so that that sinful life could, would be brought to nothing. So sin would be brought to nothing it can't have bearing on us anymore. How does he do that? Well, continuing in verse 6, he says, uh, so he said, uh, crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has, di has died has been set free from sin. All right, so before we accept the good news of Jesus, we are enslaved to sin. And you can continue reading in, in Romans 6, and he goes into more detail about that. But here he says, we died so that we will no longer be enslaved to sin. That means in the past, our old selves, we were enslaved to sin. And right now, we can sin, but we don't have to. Those of us who are believers, we don't have to sin. Those of us who have accepted the good news of Jesus, we do it, and we can, but we don't have to. We're not a slave to sin. Without Jesus, we are slaves to sin. Uh, but that old self has died. And so the Bible tells us we've been set free from sin. Um, someday, praise the Lord, there's a day that we will no longer be able to sin. We will be com completely freed from that, from this body of sin, and we will no longer even be able to sin. We'll have a glorified body. 
um, and we will be completely united with God in a new heaven and new earth. But for now, we don't have to sin, even though we can sin. So Christian, if you feel like sin is too powerful of a force in your life and you can't resist it, then you're believing the devil's lie that sin is still your slave master. We are no longer enslaved to sin. It's not too powerful a force. It can't tell you what to do anymore. That's the devil's lie. Um, if you're a believer in Christ and his message of salvation, you're not a slave to sin. You can say no to sin. Titus chapter 2 teaches us this as well. This is another of Paul's letters. And in Titus chapter 2, he says, The grace of God has appeared. All right, and this whole passage we're studying here is about God's grace. If there's grace, then let's just keep on sinning. Well, he says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions who are zealous for good works. So the grace of God has appeared, training us to renounce ungodliness. It teaches us that we can say no to sin. Uh, that's what God's grace does. It, it frees us and empowers us to say no to sin. In verse 8, we read Romans chapter 6, verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Verse 9, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So Jesus died once, never to die again. Death has no dominion over him. Uh, Death is, death, and we're connected with him, so this is hope for us. Death is more than just our bodies expiring. Uh, death is a consequence of Adam, the first human, exercising his will against God. So death is inseparably connected to sinfulness. Now, if we look in James chapter 1, he shows us this connection with sin and death. In James chapter 1, uh, we read, Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So you see that sin and death is really the same thing. Uh, death is just sin full grown. And if death no longer has dominion over us and death is sin full grown, then anything less than full grown, that's not going to have dominion over us either. Jesus conquering death shows that he's total victory over sin. And us being connected to Jesus, dying with him and raising with him, we too have dominion over sin and death. It, does, it can't control us any longer. Verse 10 says, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. It's not just killing sinfulness, but then the gift of righteousness, to live to God. And so uh, these are all truths that Paul presents, saying the gospel message connects you to Jesus' death and resurrection, paying the penalty for sin and triumphing over sin. Sin is no longer in tar charge of you. So what is our response to these truths? That's what he gets to in verse 11. He says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The first thing we need to do as Christians, if you've been struggling with having that new life, the first thing you need to do is consider. You need to consider. Many of us aren't doing this. Uh, we accepted Christ to be freed uh, from the punishment of sin, and now we're still struggling with sin because we don't consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is an action that you do with your mind. You need to be considering the gospel message and your connection to it. And then, then once you consistently and continue to do this, then there's an action you can take. In verse 12, he says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, 
to make you obey its passions. Right now we have this mortal body. Someday we'll have an immortal body and sin won't even be a part of the equation. It's true, sin is not in charge of us. We're not slaves to it any longer, but he's, it's still a part of the equation. It's still out there. It's still here. Mostly as Satan's powerful lie. He said, let's look at this verse here. Isn't this interesting? Let not sin reign. Don't let sin, sin be the ruler. Don't let sin reign and make you obey it. Isn't that strange that you would let something reign? You would let something make you obey it. But really, this happens all the time. We see it in, in abusive relationships where someone doesn't have authority over another person, but that person is believing a lie, and they let that person have authority over them, and they let that person make them do things that they don't want to do. It's true in the spiritual world as well. Um, Satan, Satan's lie is his number one tool, and it's his most effective weapon against us. And uh, if you think that this is not true, consider Satan is the uh, father of lies, and, uh, and everything he does is, is a lie because there's a lot of power in it. Consider John chapter 8. Jesus gives us the alternative to Satan's lies. John chapter 8, in verse 31, he says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we can abide in God's Jesus' word, and the truth will set us free, or we can abide in Satan's lies, and we can let him reign over us and make us obey his, his, him. Uh, he's saying, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies to obey its passions. All right, so we've got this opportunity, this negative opportunity where we can let sin reign in our bodies, and then we will want to obey our body's passions. Or we can not let it do that. And so it does feel like you wanting to do these things because you will be obeying your body's passions. But you don't have to. You can let it not reign in you. How do we do this? In verse 13, this is how you don't let sin reign. Do not present your members, the members of your body, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. So if you're saying, yes, I have sin in my life, I'd like to have less sin in my life as a Christian. I'm frustrated with this. Are you presenting your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness? How can we do this? Well, we know that the word teaches that Getting drunk is a sin. Maybe you present your body uh, to sin as an instrument of unrighteousness. You present it to drinking alcohol. If, if, if you struggle with getting drunk and practicing that sin, if you buy alcohol, you are presenting yourself to that sin. Maybe you're going to buy it. Maybe you buy it. You put it in your refrigerator and you say, I'm not going to get drunk, but you have presented yourself to it. If you've had a history of getting drunk, don't present yourself to alcohol because then you'll get drunk. Lusting after uh, people and having sexual desires for people is a sin. How's a way, what is a way that we could present our members to sin as an instrument of unrighteousness? Maybe we watch things that have images in it and storylines that tempt us to lust and sin. Why watch something? And say, okay, I'm going to try real. I'm going to watch this because I'm going to enjoy all the good parts. But I'm going to try real hard not to lust and commit sexual immorality. Why do that? Why not just don't present yourself to that sinfulness? Or committing adultery is a sin, um, and you present yourself to that sin if you say, all right, I'm going to live with my girlfriend or boyfriend. We'll live together, um, but we'll be careful not to commit adultery. You're presenting yourself to to this sinfulness. Um, anger is a sin and maybe certain things get you angry and you spend time thinking about those things or you're planning what you would do and uh, you're, you're thinking about things that make you angry. You're presenting yourself. So why not change your thoughts pattern? Think of the good things. Don't think of the things that get you angry. Greed is a sin, right? To want more and more. Um, what we look at and what we watch can change our desires. We're looking at what other people have, looking at those above us um, in, the, in the social stratus, saying, oh, they have so much more, I want that. You're watching those people. You're just presenting yourself um, 
to sinfulness. But you can choose to do other things. Make a plan of what, you know, move out so you're not living with your boyfriend or girlfriend, so you don't, have, so you don't commit adultery. Um, make a plan of what I am going to think about, what I am going to listen to. What am I going to do when this person says this? I always get angry when they do that. I, what am I going to do instead? Uh, make a plan for that. Who are you going to watch? How are you going to instigate contentedness and thankfulness in your life instead of greed? So these are all just a few practical examples of people, how people present their members to sin as instruments of an unrighteousness. Do you really want victory over this sin? Remember, Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you lose one part of your body than your whole body is thrown into hell. And he's not literally talking about dismembering yourself, but he's saying get rid of those things that lead you to sin, even if it's valuable, even if it's precious. Maybe you need to get rid of your laptop because you keep sinning through that laptop. Maybe you're in a relationship, uh, not marriage, but you're in some kind of relationship that is leading to sin. Maybe you need to leave that relationship. Um, it's valuable, but if it's leading you to sin, maybe you need to throw it away. And uh, so do we really actually try hard enough to not present our members uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness? Uh, in Revelation, John tell, commends this one church for resisting, even though they haven't yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Do we really resist sin that much, or do we just say, we believe the lie, it can tell us what to do, and we have to do it, so I, why even resist? But if you've accepted the gospel, then you know through this teaching we've read in Romans 6, it can't tell you what to do. If you resist, you can say no to sin. Uh, if you resist the devil, James tells us, he will flee from you. If you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. The lie is, it won't work, so don't even try. The truth is, do it. Persist in it. Romans 6 Looking, uh, continuing in verse 13, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. You have to overcome evil with good. You can't just leave a vacuum in your life and say, all right, I'm going to stop doing these sins, those sins that I just mentioned. I'm just going to stop doing those. You've got to present yourselves to God. You've got to pursue God if you're going to have victory over those sins. Maybe you thought, okay, I'm not having a very, my life doesn't seem new. I'm still struggling with sin. Have you been doing this? Have you been presenting yourself to God actively? Are you thinking, what is the good thing I'm going to do? I'm going to plan how I'm going to pursue God and his instructions and his righteousness and how I'm going to avoid the sinfulness. It takes plan and it takes persistence. And it can be a lot of persistence. And uh, it's not going to happen the first time. It's not going to happen right away. You've got to persist in it. But the lie is, you know, you, you fail once or twice or maybe even set many times. And the lie is, see, it doesn't work. But do you trust God? Do you believe his message that this does work? This changing your mind about um, sin having dominion over you. You've died with Christ. It really doesn't have dominion over you. You've been raised with Christ. You really can live a new life but you've got to plan for it. And you've got to persist in it. Finally, in verse 14, he says, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. So this is interesting. This little passage here is bookmarked with grace. He began by saying, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he concludes with, um, since you are under grace, no, sin will not continue. You, sin has no dominion over you. You're not under the law of sin and death. You are under grace. Where grace begins, sin ends. So in your struggle, return to the gospel over and over and over and over. That gospel message is the key. Meditate on it. Think about it. Pray about it. Memorize maybe these verses here in Romans 6. Uh, memorize some of those verses that I mentioned in the sermon. Um, memorize them. Write them down. Think about them. That would be presenting your body as an instrument of righteousness. Your eyes are going to have to read these verses. Your brain is going to have to work hard. And maybe it would take 
months to memorize these Bible verses for you, but that would show I'm presenting my body, my mind, my, my eyes, my mouth as I say these verses over and over to God as instruments of righteousness, and you will find victory in your life if you give yourself to God. And, uh, and uh, you can imagine the scenario. Two people. One person is born again. He's a child of God. The other person is, has rejected God. They both are struggling with sin. This, the beauty of this message here in, in Romans 6 is it's the same for both people. Turn to God. The one who has rejected God, if he turns to God, he will find forgiveness of sins and the ability to do right. The one who has been born again, if he turns back to that gospel that he first turned to and he does it again and again, then he will have victory over sin. And, and he, will, he will convince himself that sin does not have dominion over him anymore. But it is going to take persistence. And my prayer for you is that um, you will experience this. So let me pray for you and for myself. And let's let God's work, God's word work in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, I pray for each person here who has heard this message. I pray that they will believe it and that they wouldn't be jaded through years of struggling with sin, but they would believe Paul's words, you, your words through your servant Paul, that you need to consider. we need to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to you. We need to continue to consider this, that we need to stop uh, letting sin reign in our mortal bodies. We need to stop presenting ourselves to sin, but present ourselves to you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in the believers' hearts who are hearing this message and uh, explain to them just what action they need to take to see clearly what is it they're doing that is actually presenting themselves to sin and how do they need to change that. I pray that you would get them excited about presenting themselves to you I pray that they would do, abide in your word so that your truth would set them free, that they, we would um, be convinced that your truth can set us free from sin and that it has no dominion over us. I pray that you would help believers who have determined to memorize your word as an instrument to be delivered from sinfulness, that you would empower them to memorize it effectively and recall it at the right time when they are being tempted with sin. I pray that you would help people to make good plans and to persist in those plans of offering themselves to you. May your gospel message transform us and be the spring from which we continue to, to, to grow and become more and more like your son, that we might find the joy of new life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and I will continue to be praying for the listeners to this message. If you don't have a, a church, please come out and join us and uh, try Only Bible Church. I think you'll find friendly people and a commitment to God's word. God bless.